talks today is the field of love and peace. But I'd like to begin by acknowledging our founder and pastor emeritus, Reverend Phil Pearson, who shared with us last week a simple but powerful message. If you didn't get a chance to hear it, I highly recommend you listen to it on the YouTube, Capital City YouTube channel. Last Sunday, of course, was Mother's Day. And Phil used that occasion to remind us of the mothering qualities and activities of God. He reminded us that like the ideal mother, God loves us unconditionally, absolutely. And he loves us with perfect discernment. Now, this was an interesting point that Phil made. He said by discernment, he meant that a mother discerns in her child the good only. The child may behave violently or harmfully, but he is not his behavior. The ideal mother does not confuse behavior with essence. When God loves us unconditionally, he is seeing us as whole, complete, and perfect just the way we are. And we, as the eachness of the allness of, that is God, have the same capacity to love ourselves and everyone and everything in the world unconditionally, and to see us all as whole, complete, and perfect. Learning to do this, Phil told us, is the central challenge facing us today. So let us ask ourselves, do I love myself and my fellow humans unconditionally? Do I see myself and others as good, as perfect in our essence? We truth students know how to check this out. One of our basic disciplines is watching our thoughts and our feelings so we can change the ones that do not serve us. One of the fundamental principles that we have in unity and new thought is thoughts held in mind produce after their kind. Another way to say this is the world that I have is the world that I believe. Or yet a third version, life is lived from the inside out. If I have an unhappy life, then I'm probably thinking unhappy thoughts. If I'm feeling unloved or unlovable, then I probably am believing myself to be unloved or unlovable. So back to Reverend Phil's challenge. Do I love myself? Do I love the people in my life? Do I love everybody unconditionally? Do I see myself and all these people as perfect, just as we are? If not, no blame, no judgment. If I'm not loving unconditionally, recognizing this is just the place from which to start again to do so. And as always, the first place to start is with our attitude toward ourselves. Did I criticize myself today? Did I call myself something negative? Did I say something like, gosh, I'm being stupid, or when will I ever learn? Did I respond in anger when I made a mistake? Did I feel shame or disgust with myself for any reason? Now we work to notice these things for two reasons. First, because I want to live a happy, creative life. And so I want to be aware of any time that I make myself sad or unhappy, or when I stifle the wonder of my being. Secondly, because I want to disidentify from my thoughts and behaviors. God loves me for who I am, not for what I do or what I don't do. And so I'm choosing to treat myself the way God treats me, to love myself for who I am and not for anything I might do or fail to do. I intend to mother myself with God's perfect and unwavering help. So the next time I find myself making myself wrong for any reason, I will stop and release the criticism. I will affirm God loves me absolutely and does not hold my behavior against me. No matter what I just did, God is loving me right now. And no doubt, sometime soon, maybe within, this, within the hour, that old habit of mind will show up again as yet another negative self-harming thought, but that's okay. As I train myself to notice these moments, 
I also train myself to forgive and release and to use this as another opportunity to love myself as God loves me, unconditionally, joyfully, warmly. And by virtue of the one presence, one power, one love, one substance of God shining through all people and all things at all times, when I learn to love myself with commitment and abandon, I am simultaneously learning to love everybody in the same way. The process by which I notice critical thoughts about myself is the same that I use to notice negative thoughts about another person. And the release of those thoughts and the affirmation of unconditional love in their place is also the same. When I've had a critical judgment of someone, I now use noticing that as the chance to affirm love. God loves you absolutely and does not hold your behavior against you and neither do I. No matter what you just did, God is loving you right now and so am I. And in that loving space that we create by loving unconditionally, we can now safely dwell. That feeling that we create when we release negative judgment is a place of endless calm and serenity. So let's take a moment to affirm the supremacy of love active in our lives today through song. And I invite us to open our wings of song to number 165 and affirm together by singing, God is love. Gordon? Singular benefit to taking on the practice of converting judgmental, critical, and violent thoughts about ourselves and others to thoughts of unconditional love is that we generate a feeling of profound peace and security. We banish fear and welcome in a deep feeling of calm and ease. 
During our prayer circle last week, we read Thursday's daily word, which was calm. I'd like to read it now in this context of how unconditional love creates calm. This is what the Daily Word said on Thursday. Calm envelops me as I rest in the peace of God. There is a place beyond thought, beyond action, a place of perfect peace and calm. Quiet contemplation leads me to this place where I feel a peace that is beyond words. Here, my mind and heart rest in the presence and power of God. I relax as my desire to know this presence beckons, calls me into its embrace, and cradles me in deep, sweet bliss. Everything else falls away until I am one with this calming presence, the peace of God. As I bring my attention to the present moment, I carry my newfound calm with me. I slow the rhythm of my life, settle my thoughts, and more easily feel the presence of the divine. I am comforted knowing I am never separate from God. The peace of God is my peace forever. My friends, when we love unconditionally, we inevitably, as the Daily Word says, slow the rhythm of our lives, settle our thoughts, and more easily feel the presence of the divine. We find ourselves dwelling in this place of perfect peace and calm. And what could be sweeter? Now, reading this daily word put me in mind of the Rumi poem that talks about that place beyond thought, beyond action. Some of us know this poem as the field, but it's actually part of a longer poem called A Great Wagon. The wagon in the title is the vehicle that brings us to consciousness of the indwelling, all-pervasive presence of God and only God. If you're not familiar with Rumi, I highly recommend you check him out. He is the 13th century Sufi version of Charles and Myrtle Fillmore. Like our co-founders, he was a great spiritual teacher. Now, he composed tens of thousands of verses, all celebrating the identity of the human with the divine, acknowledging the same truth that we proclaim that there is only one presence, one power, one love active in ourselves and in the universe. One of his more famous poems is the one I'd like to share with us today. I won't read it in its entirety for it's too long, but you can find it online by searching for it by its title, A Great Wagon. The section I will read demonstrates a tender compassion for the human condition, for the challenges of error consciousness, and for the utter peace and joy that show up when we finally decide to let go and let God. These are his words. Today, like every other day, we wake up empty and frightened. Don't open the door to the study and begin reading. Take down a musical instrument. Let the beauty we love be what we do. There are hundreds of ways to kneel and kiss the ground. Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the words each other don't make any sense. The breeze at dawn has secrets to tell you. Don't go back to sleep. You must ask for what you really want. Don't go back to sleep. People are going back and forth across the door sill where the two worlds touch. The door is round and open. Don't go back to sleep. Now there's much to unpack in these few verses that Rumi shares with us. It's basically about how to live today in the unconditional love that always brings us the peace that passes understanding. Today, like every other day he starts out, we wake up empty and frightened. Here he is speaking metaphysically about coming into consciousness, waking up. We all start our lives disconnected from the indwelling Christ. 
And whenever I'm not focused on my divine self, I do feel empty and scared, assuming that I'm alone and must defend myself from threats. What to do about this condition? Rumi says, don't open the door to the study and begin reading. Take down a musical instrument. Don't turn to the mind, in other words, but to the soul. Open our hearts wide and let God sing through us. Let the beauty we love, he says, be what we do. Let the beauty we love be what we do. What do you find beautiful and sublime? Can you let the sense of wonder and joy you find in this be the guiding energy of your life? Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the words each other don't make any sense. Beyond thoughts of judgments and conditions is the state of mind and heart where the human of us can simply relax. When we surrender those ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, we meet up with the God of ourselves. When we ignore our thoughts, we enter a realm too full to talk about, a realm of unconditional love, joy, peace, health, serenity. This field Rumi is talking about is where we find the wonder of our being. But stay awake, he reminds us. Our human conditioning is always seeking to put us back to sleep, to remove our focus on the divine of ourselves and get back down and dirty with the conditions, conditions and circumstances of life and death. There's nothing wrong with this, but as he says, the breeze at dawn has secrets to tell you. Don't go back to sleep. You must ask for what you really want. Don't go back to sleep. The breeze at dawn here is the refreshing wonder and ecstasy we feel when we awaken to the splendor and the unconditional love of the indwelling Christ. It has secrets to tell us if only we stay awake and concentrate on listening. It is all up to us to say yes or to say no. Just as Jesus tells us so many times, you must ask for what you want. Deep in our hearts, we know what we really want, but we must ask in order to receive. Seek so that we may find. Knock so that the door will be open to us. Rumi concludes this part of his poem by observing that people are going back and forth across the door sill where the two worlds touch. Don't go back to sleep. In other words, we are always confronted with experiences of the divine and experiences of the human. We must stay awake in consciousness to experience these two as the same thing, as the universal substance, as the universal expression of divine love. So in contemplating all these things, my friends, my intention in my life right here, right now, as I share with you, is to dwell wide awake in this one world with its two aspects. The key is my commitment to love myself, to love you, to love everybody on the planet unconditionally. Loving despite mistakes, despite errors, acts of violence and pettiness. Loving in spite of all these things brings me, as the Daily Word says, to this place beyond thought, beyond action, a place of perfect peace and calm. It takes us all to the field, as Rumi says, beyond ideas of right doing or wrong doing. Do you want this to be your field, your peace, your experience today, and for the rest of your life? Then let us commit ourselves to the discipline of noticing any thoughts of wrongdoing and right doing and letting them go. We notice and release all thoughts of judgment and criticism, whether of ourselves or of anybody else at all, and instead surround them with unconditional love. The American Christian mystic Thomas Merton wrote once, 
The beginning of love is the will to let those we love be perfectly themselves. That is God's will for us. As the eachness of God, let us today commit to deepen our practice of unconditional love. And so together, we find each other in that field where the beauty we love is what we do in every moment. Love unlocks the door for all of us to experience the fellowship of unconditional love. And let's celebrate that in song, my friends, by opening our wings of song to hymn number 203, What a Fellowship, hymn number 203. So my friends, let us commit today to lean on the everlasting arms, to be still and know the I am is always with us, thrilling us with unconditional love, acceptance, joy, embrace. With God within me, I love myself unconditionally. Let's say that together. With God within me, I love myself unconditionally. And with God within me, I love you unconditionally. Together? And with God within me, I love you unconditionally. And my friends, when we commit to this unconditional love, starting with ourselves and spreading out to the entire world, we meet each other in a field beyond ideas of right doing and wrong doing where words are no longer necessary, where only peace dwells infinitely, and we celebrate this peace and love with each other, safe and secure in the everlasting arms of a loving, infinitely patient, and perfectly content God. And so for this peace that passes understanding, through the activity of love, we say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Amen. <laughs>